you got your first assignment for the semester. So assignment 201 is uh, to design a table and a chair. It only has to be one chair and one table. I'm pretty loose with the definition of what defines a table. Uh, my definition is it's something you can put something on. Uh, and a chair is something you can sit on. That's about it. So we're, we're deliberately being vague so that you guys can have some fun and creativity. I'm not overly worried about gravity when it comes to the chair either, or structural integrity. Um, I want it to be nice. I want it to be well modeled. Um, the, the key things on it are, did you model it well? Were you able to, to build what you wanted to build? Is it, is it interesting to look at? You know, I mean, don't make me a cube and call it a day, right? Something interesting. You know, spend time actually designing something that I want to look at. Uh, and then the other part of it is going to have to do with how the textures are applied, the fact that textures are applied, materials are applied, and how they look. Are they appropriate scale? We haven't talked about that yet. That's coming. Are they the appropriate scale? Do, do they look realistic? Those kinds of things. I am not asking for any kind of a background. So this is kind of like those old Apple commercials where you're on this white plane in a white sky. Uh, with nothing else, you just have your table and chairs. So uh, no background, no context, just the table and just the chair. Um, so that's it. Oh, in terms of what you're turning in, you're giving me three, quote, perfect renderings of this. So three different angles showing me that table and that chair. Don't, please don't forget to give me three. It's, it's amazing to me how uh, people lose their attention to detail and they turn in one rendering. Okay? If you turn in one rendering, you just got yourself, best case, a 33% on the assignment. Best case. So just don't give me three. right? And this is the same thing throughout the semester. Most people can manage three renderings for this first one, but by the end, like when we're doing the light fixtures or whatever, they like do one rendering of the two light fixtures that you need. And it's like, no, that's not enough. Like, make sure you read what I'm asking for and give me that, please. Don't leave stuff out because it's just wasting points. So I will emphasize that when it gets a little bit closer as well. Today we're going to build a piece of a concrete bridge um, and we'll get some texture on it. So we'll build another piece and then eventually we'll kind of assemble them into a little bridge with a wall behind it. Um, the goal here is to get you through a certain set of commands so that you can start to um, build something on your own. Today, it'll end up being pretty scripted in terms of, you know, do this and then do this and then do this and then do this. Uh, the goal is that in another week or two, you guys will then start to make something on your own. So you'll have to figure out, okay, if, and I'll, I'll start with like a window and it'll be, how do I, how do I figure out how to make a window? You know, what shapes am I going to use? How am I going to combine things together? What am I going to do? So I'm really just trying to, uh, over the next week or so, build up your skill set such that then I can say, okay, now we're going to start with a simple object that you have to figure out how to make as opposed to a set of steps. So we're still in the realm where there's no need to do any comments or anything on this because we're all making the same thing. We're all following the same set of steps. Um, I've deliberately made some parts of this shape more complicated so that you end up having to deal with the complications of it. Um, today we'll focus a lot on how, to, how do joints come together, how do we control edges and, and corners and that sort of thing. Um, so I've gone ahead and I've opened up Rhino. Um, I'm going to start with a new document that is in the large object inches template. That's the template we'll be using throughout the semester, but I'm just double checking that here. So it'll be large object inches. I'll go ahead and say open. That will open up the large object inches template. Before I get started, I'm going to go up to my options because I haven't done that just yet. So we're going to go to tools and then options all the way to the bottom under view, OpenGL, and I'm going to turn off that tessellation option, which is what causes those lines not to show up. We'll go ahead and say OK. And now I can actually start to get started here. Um, I'm going to start working by drawing in the top view, uh, and I'm going to end up drawing the shape that's down here at the bottom. And you'll see that there's repetition built in, like we'll have to use Rotate 3D and you know, some of the stuff that we learned last class. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and, and move into the top view for what I'm doing. And I'm going to go ahead and turn on some of my object snaps down here at the bottom. So I'll turn on end, mid, and perpendicular. Those are the three that I like to leave on while I'm working. And the other ones I'll toggle on and to toggle off as I need them. So we're going to go ahead and start making the shape that's down below. The measurements on this shape are in inches. So when I start to draw, and I'm going to do it in front of you as well, I'm going to use the polyline tool. 
and I'm going to start right there at the origin. Does it really matter? No, but I'm going to go ahead and start right at the origin. So I'll type 0, 0 and hit enter on the keyboard. And that starts right at the origin. And I'm going to use essentially the distance and direction method to draw. I'll turn on ortho so that I'm going straight up. Alternatively, I can hold down shift on the keyboard. That would do the same thing. And now I'll go ahead and start to draw. So the first thing I need is the height. So it's at 36 inches. And so I'll go ahead and type in 36. I don't need the inch sign, but it is going to ask me conf to confirm the direction. So I want it to be going straight up so it's one more click of the mouse. The next one over here is I'm going to go over by 4 inches. And so that then gives me the 4 inches. Now this was deliberate on my part. The outside edge of this slopes away. So this is a hard one to draw. And what people have a tendency to do is they draw straight down and then over to get that slope. This is a perfect opportunity, though, to use those relative coordinates that I talked about when we were doing the 2D drawing lecture, the second one, exercise 202. This is where we would throw the at sign in place. So relative to the last point that I clicked, I want to go negative 2 in the x direction, followed by negative 36 in the y direction. And suddenly, I have that angle without having to draw a guideline and then draw an extra line. So it saves me some steps just by knowing that I can switch to this method. So it's at negative 2 comma negative 36. I'll go ahead and press Enter. And that gives me the slope on the outside of this shape. We're then going to go down by 6 inches. So I'll go ahead and type in 6 inches. It's going down. And here's another opportunity for my relative coordinates. So in this case, it would be at, so relative to that last point, I want to go over by 30 inches. So it's not negative, it's positive this time, so 30. So at 30, comma, negative, and I'm going down another 6 inches. So I'm looking at the drawing on my sheet here and saying I want to go down a negative 6 inches, and I'll press Enter. That gives me that lower part of the little um, cross section here. So you guys all have the handout in front of you, uh, so, you, so you're referencing it there. But of course, you could go into our exercises. Um, sorry, wrong class here. Uh, or if you're having trouble seeing it or, or what have you, it's right there. So you can always, always look at it there as well. So I've drawn that. Now I have to continue on with my shape. Now one of the things that I'll point out today is that there are some efficiencies built into this shape such that I wouldn't actually have to draw the whole shape. I could draw smaller bits of it. But for practice, I'm going to end up drawing the whole thing. So this is virtually almost all I need to keep going because I could mirror this whole shape. But we'll keep drawing for the practice of it. So I'm going to use my relative coordinates. So relative to that last point I clicked, I'm going to go over another 30 inches. So I'm still going positive in the x direction. But this time, I'm going up by 6 inches. So instead of typing negative 6, it's just going to be 6. And I'll press Enter. And that gives me that side of the slope. I'm going to go up straight by 6 inches. So I'll type in 6 inches. And then I'll click on my direction. There it is. This is one where it's sloping back. So it's another time when I'm going to use the at sign. So relative to the last point, I want to go over by negative 2 inches. So negative 2 in the x direction and up by 36 in the y direction. And I'll press Enter. So one of the tricky things about that is really just understanding which one is negative and which one is positive and why I'm going in the order that I'm going. So it just takes a little bit of practice. So the rest of this is pretty easy. We're going to go over by 4 inches. We're going to go down by 36 inches. And then we'll end right where we started. So I want to snap right to the end there to finish. Alternatively, I could press C to close the shape. And that gives me that closed polyline shape right there. So like I said, alternatively, I could draw just half the shape. So I could start here and go um, 24 up by 36 over by 4 at negative 2 comma negative 36. Oops, helps if I can type correctly. Uh, at negative 2 comma negative 36. 6 inches at 30, comma, negative 6, and finish there, thereby drawing just a quarter of the shape. And then I could, if I needed it, mirror this like that to create the other half of the shape. So you don't always have to do it by drawing the whole shape. 
But again, we're practicing today, so extra drawing doesn't hurt. So I'm always going to show you these little tricks along the way to get you um, faster at how you work. So the next thing that we need to do is I'm going to switch from the top view over into the perspective view. So I'll go ahead and double click to make the perspective view large. And then I want to use Rotate 3D, which we used last class, to make this stand up in place. Now where I rotate my 3D from doesn't really matter. Um, I could rotate it right here. I could also rotate it down here at the bottom. I think it's easiest to rotate it right there on the walking surface, so we'll stick with that. I'm going to use Rotate 3D, which is available under the Transform menu, and I'll, type ro or I'll select Rotate 3D. Alternatively, I could type in Rotate 3D. It's going to ask me to select my objects to rotate. That would be this. I'll go ahead and press Enter. And then it'll ask me for the rotation axis. So like I said, the rotation axis can be the walking surface of this. So from there to there. And then I need my angle or first reference point. We'll choose the first reference point being right there. And I have ortho turned on, so it's really easy. It just snaps right up at 90 degrees. If I didn't have ortho turned on, it could go anywhere in between, but I could hold down the shift key on the keyboard and that would allow it to snap to 90 degrees as well. So our goal there is to have this standing up like this so that we can start to build this out. So I have the first piece here. I'm going to use the offset command to make another copy of this four feet back. So if I have it selected and I go to curve uh, offset, offset curve. Notice that in this case, it's, it's wanting me to offset it in this plane that I'm working in. Um, I want it to go back this way. So right here in my side to offset options, instead of saying in C plane, no, I'm going to say in C plane, yes. And suddenly this is now going back in space instead. And I could type in 48 inches or four feet and you can see that it's going back 48 inches as opposed to out by 48 inches. So again, that was just by choosing this in C plane set to yes, and then it'll offset either to the front or to the back. I want it going to the back, so I'll go ahead and click there as well. And so that gives me two curves from here and from here. Now on the next part of this, this is on step four of the handout, I ask you to type explode. And you don't really need to explode it, you could explode this after the fact, but for the purposes of practicing, I'm going to show you the exploded version and then I'll go back and, and actually I'll do it un unexploded and then I'll do it exploded. So what we're going to do is we want to create surfaces that go between these two curves, which is an ideal place to use the loft command, which we've used before. And if I were to take these two surfaces like that and go up to um, surface and then loft, so second one down there, it's going to ask me to select the seam. So I want this to match up on both of these curves so that when I create the surface, let me switch over into shaded mode so you can see it, it's creating the surface where I've got flat panels between each of these shapes. If, when I go to do the loft, oops, sorry, my seam is not there. Let's say they don't match and they're like that. When I go to create the shape, I'm going to get a very different result with how this loft comes together. So that's not what I wanted my shape to look like. So we can do a loft. So I can go to surface and then loft my seams in the right spot like that, which gives me one continuous poly surface all the way around. And then I could explode the poly surface to give me individual surfaces. Alternatively, I could explode the curves first and then select opposing curves and loft each individually, like that and like that, all the way around. So it's just different methods of doing it. Obviously, this is, uh, ends up being a little bit um, more time consuming than lofting the whole thing together, like this. So I'll take those two and then loft. I do want them uh, broken into separate pieces, though, at this point. So I'm going to go ahead and type in explode so that they are individual little surfaces. I'm not keeping them together. So at this point, I have the surfaces going around my object, but I don't have the surfaces on the end. It's still hollow here. So I'd like to fill those pieces in. And so I'll do that 
by using the surface from three or four corner points. And I'm going to fill in this surface right there first. So I fill that piece in. The next one that I'm going to fill in, I'm going to ask you to do it this way on purpose because it's, uh, unfortunately, it, um, when we go to do something later on, this will be the cleanest way of doing it. So when I pick the surface from three or four corner points, I'm going to pick one, two, and three and end there. So I end up with that little triangle in the corner. And you can see on your drawing there's a reference. There's an arrow with a reference to that little diagonal to help you out. So I'll do the same thing surface from three or four corner points, and I'll go one, two, three, and to the midpoint there. Same thing, one, two, three, and four. And I'm just right clicking to repeat the last command. There's three, and then one more for this, one, two, three, and four. So that's ultimately what I'm looking for, is for all these separate little shapes. Now I've already created those shapes, so it makes sense to just copy them to the back rather than redraw them. I, of course, could do them all again, but I, in, I could just select them. Let me make sure I have just those selected. There we go. And then I can copy them. So I'll go to um, Transform and then Copy. It's going to ask me for my point to copy from. I'll pick that corner right there, and we'll copy right to that corner right there. And I'll go ahead and press enter. So now I have the bulk of what this shape looks like, which is pretty good. Now I'd like to take a moment and point out that I've obviously I've made this shape, but remember back to that little quarter of the piece that I made, or, or the line. If I do the same thing with this little small piece, I can use my mirrors to build this even faster. So if I went back to that piece and I went to rotate 3D, and I said, okay, we're going to rotate this up. Let me hold down shift. There it is. Let me take this and let me offset it back by, this time it would be two feet. There. Then I could take these two curves, I could loft them together. Say OK. I could take those and explode them. I could add the surfaces on the end. Notice I'm only doing it on one side there. Now this could be very easily mirrored first there, and then the whole thing could be done like that to create the shape. Do you see how I'm, I'm doing efficiency? So I'm modeling a quarter of it instead of the whole thing. So for our purposes today, there's no reason not to work through the whole object. But I want to show you this and I want to emphasize this because that's how you start to become more efficient. As you start to see this is the piece that I need and I can use my tools to, to save myself some work. So let me come back to this first piece here. And the next thing that we want to do is we want to control how these corners come together. And so if you've ever worked with concrete before or you've ever you know, observed concrete, good example is the little bench out here you notice that instead of having a sharp edge on concrete, typically on the formwork for something that's finished like this, you have a little chamfer or a little bevel on the edge. And that's because that sharp edge of concrete, one, is uncomfortable if you were to sit on it, but two, has a tendency to break and chip when you remove formwork and stuff. So we'll, we'll, we'll basically create a chamfer on this edge uh, and all the way around for that matter, kind of like what's happening outside there. So to do that, I'm going to go up to the surface menu and I'm going to choose chamfer surfaces. Alternatively, I could type in chamfer SRF for chamfer surface. Up here in the command line, it says select first surface to chamfer, or let's pay attention to distances. So these are the distances uh, of the chamfer. Right now it's set at one inch by one inch, which is going to get a pretty good sized chamfer. I want to cut that down a little bit and do it at maybe a half inch by a half inch. So I'll type in I'll click on distance and then type in 0.5 and 0.5. When I'm done here, all I need to do is select the first surface, so we'll pick that surface, and then the second surface, that one. And you'll see that it creates that little chamfer for me. Likewise, I could chamfer from here to there and get that surface. 
I can move over to the inside and I'm, again, I'm right clicking to repeat the chamfer command. I could go from this surface to that surface. So that looks pretty good on top so far. But what about if I want to chamfer this surface and this surface? Well, now this, this corner is kind of getting a little messy. So we'll just go ahead and keep chamfering there and there. So I've worked my way there. We're going to come down here and we're going to chamfer those. And then we're going to chamfer this very bottom right there and there. Now because these are going to be connected together, I'm not going to worry about chamfering this front edge. We're going to skip that one for right now. But I can work my way over on this side and do the same thing. So those two, these two, these two, that one, and that one. And then I could do that one and that one there. So I've worked my way around and done the chamfers, but I'm still getting these kind of nasty little corners. So I need to clean those corners up. And this is what ultimately happens when you're working in Rhino, is you have to fix things. So because I've got this, I need to create an object that is going to help me to, to kind of control what I'm seeing and what I'm not seeing. And part of the goal today is for you guys to learn what you're seeing on the screen and how do you, how do you, how do you clean things up. So what I'll do is I'll create a line, a polyline, and I'm going to go from this corner to that corner to that corner and back to itself, which is essentially creating a little tiny triangle that's right in the corner. Now notice when I try to orbit around that, it's really awkward. It's, it, moves, it moves out of my screen and I'm, I'm struggling to see that. Do you guys see how that works? So what I can do in Rhino is with an object like this selected, I can type Z for zoom followed by S for selected. And it's going to reorient my view around that object. So when I go to orbit, it's going to let me orbit right around just that one object, which is really, really convenient. So I'm going to zoom selected on that one object. I can really see what's going on here. And then I need to do some trims. So go ahead and type in the trim command, or go to edit and then trim, or press control T. And I'll get rid of these extra pieces that I don't really need. So I don't need that piece there. I don't need that piece there. I don't need this piece right there. I don't need that piece there. And pretty soon you end up with uh, a hole, but a nice clean corner. Once that's nice and clean, I can go ahead and press Enter. And I have two options. I can do a surface from three or four corner points, which is pretty simple. Or I could do a patch to fill that piece in. So I just did a three or four corner points. I'll press Enter, and that fills that little corner in. Yeah. So I'm going to show you again on the next side. Okay. So over on this side, that's what I'm looking at now. So again, it's kind of messy. So what I want is I want a triangle that goes from this corner to the top to that corner there and then back on itself. And so I'll go in and I'll click on my polyline and I'll draw from this corner up to the top there, down to that corner there, and back across. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm creating the ends of where all of those chamfers should end. And then I can use the trim command, so control T or type trim, to get rid of this extra piece and that extra piece right there. Once that's done, this time I'll use the patch command. I can go to surface and then patch. I just need it to be two by two, so two U spans and two B spans. And I'll go ahead and say OK, and that fills that surface in as well. Doesn't matter which method you use. If you want it three or four corner points, that's fine. If you want to patch it, that's fine as well. So I've done those corners. In the interest of repetition, I'll move over here. I'll go ahead and draw my triangle again, like that. Now here's an opportunity if I went to try to move there, I'm, my view's off again. I can't orbit right around that point anymore. So here's another opportunity to do Z for zoom followed by S for selected. I've reoriented my view around just that one object. And now I can go ahead and use my trim command again. So I'll type in trim. And we'll get rid of these extra pieces. There we go. And those are all trimmed off. Same thing for this corner. Back to my polyline. 
right there. I'll select that triangle and then I'll type trim and we'll get rid of those extra pieces. Oops. Sorry, didn't quite pick trim. And we'll get rid of that. And that, and that, and that, and that. There we go. Last thing I need to fill those in. So again, I can do, uh, let me hit enter. I can do a patch, which would fill that in. Two U spans, two V spans. Alternatively, I could do a surface from three or four corner points and fill that in right there and press enter as well. Either one of those options is just fine. So all of that turned out really pretty clean. If we scroll down here at the bottom, this seam is nice and clean as well. So those two chamfered nicely, so I don't have to worry about that. Then we get to this seam. Hmm. Well, there's a little bit of a problem there. So if we look closely at it, we can see that this surface comes down and meets the chamfer right there, but this front surface and the bottom surface meet at a different place. So they meet right there. So those are, those are a bit problematic. Now, if I were going to do a rendering of this shape and I were rendering from out here, could I see that there's a little gap there? Nope, can't see it. In which case, it would be perfectly fine to leave it and I don't really have to fix it. However, if I wanted this shape to be 3D printed, if I wanted to take it over and make one of these 3D prints of it, not that this is the most attractive shape and you'd want to 3D print it, but let's say for right now you wanted to 3D print it, that little error would make a big problem for 3D printing. It doesn't like those open uh, pieces. So let's talk about how you might fix it. So there are a couple different strategies for how you fix it. Uh, and I'll show you both strategies. One I think is a little bit easier. The other one is a little bit more complicated. Um, and I'll tell you the difference. I'll do the first one on this left side here. So what I'll do is I'll use my polyline tool again, and this time I'm going to go from that corner in the middle, and I'll go out to where I meet up with that corner there, so the higher corner. And I'll go ahead and press enter. And when I do that, I can use that line that I just created, that line right there, as a trim. I'll go ahead and type in trim, and I can get rid of the extra surface there. So now I've got a line that goes from my corner here right up to meet at that point right there. I still have an opening here and an opening there, but if I were to delete this shape, oops, sorry, I have to finish the trim. If I were to just delete this shape, I could then use my surface from three or four corner points and just go one, two, three, and four, and that would then fill in that surface nice and clean without those openings. So what's the difference? Well, the difference here is that uh, the, um, the shape, this, this surface here, has an ever so slight twist to it. So it gets a little bit bigger and it twists. Could you tell? No. Does it make a nice 3D printable model? Absolutely. So we're tweaking it a little bit. We're faking it just a little bit from what it might really be, but it's close enough for our purposes. So that's a good strategy and it's pretty clean to work with. The other strategy is to work with the surface itself. And that is to take this surface that, uh, that was created and to use a command called untrim on it. And so if I type in untrim and I click on this edge, it'll give me the full surface of what it was. I can do that with either surface. I can do that with this surface. I could do it with that surface. But I'm going to untrim this. Then I'll select the surface itself. Oops, I have to press enter first. I'll select the surface itself and I'll come over here and say, show me the object control points. And when I do that, I get a little point in the corner right here. So that's that button right here. It looks like a circle with a couple dots next to it. And I can then select the point here of the surface. I can move that point, so I just typed in move. I can move that point to right there. And now I can use the surface itself as a trim right there. So I didn't have to draw the line. So technically, this method with the untrim is a faster way of doing this, but it involves a little bit more knowledge than just drawing a line and trimming it off and then uh, creating a new surface. So either way, we'll get you the same result on that lower corner. So I've now worked my way all the way around this edge 
and that edge, I need to repeat the process over on the back side. So I'm asking you guys today to do it this way where you actually build out all the, all the corners because it'll give you a lot of practice in how these come together and how to fix it and how to see what you're seeing. If I were building this from scratch, I would only build this quarter like I was talking about earlier and I would only do the chamfers on this corner. So I would come in here and I do chamfer surface oops, and I would do there to there, there to there, there to there there to there, there, and like that. And then I would fix just this corner. So I'd come in and I'd do my first triangle. One, two, three, four. I'm going to type in Z for zoom, S for selected, so I can orbit right around that point. And then I can go ahead and trim, and we'll get rid of the pieces that I don't need. And then we'll patch it. Then I can come back over to this side, same thing. One, two, three, four. Trim. There it is. Enter, and then patch. Those two are fixed. Come down, I still have to fix this side. I might need to zoom select it again to select that object. I'm going to do the untrim method, so I'll type in untrim, which is actually a really cool command when you think about it, is that if you've trimmed something and you ever want the whole object back, you can just untrim it. Um, and that gives me the rest of the object. I'll then take the object, turn on my control points for that object, take my control point, move it, so it goes from there to right there. Then I can take my object, type in trim, and I can get rid of that part of the object right there. So I've just created right, this shape here. I can then take the whole shape, oops, let me hit escape there, take the whole shape, and I can mirror it and then mirror it again to create the whole object. So it's, it's certainly a more efficient way of doing it because I don't have to do all of the corners. But again, for your purposes, it doesn't hurt you to do all the corners because it's practice. Remember, today is always about practice. So when all of that's done, and I'm going to let you guys work through it. I know I went through it rather quickly, but that's okay. You guys will have the rest of the lab period to work on this. Uh, when you're all done, I want you to use the skills you learned in exercise 204, last class with V-Ray to go ahead and assign this material, uh, this object and material. You'll probably pick one of the concrete materials. And then give yourself the infinite plane underneath and the little directional light to get the lighting set up and then perform a rendering. So what you're turning in today or what you're posting on the course website is a rendering of this little piece. A couple things to keep in mind when you're doing the rendering. When you create the infinite plane, there it is, it will show up on the ground in my case, this object is below where the ground would be, so I either need to take the infinite plane and move it down, or I need to take my object and move it up, one or the other. So there would be a move, V for vertical, and I can have that sitting up above the ground plane like that for my rendering. So assign the materials, create the directional light, create the rendering, and that's what you'll end up posting today. So I'm asking you to build on what we learned last class in V-Ray so that you actually have to assign materials and render. So I don't want captures anymore, I want actual renders. So the thing that we're making is something called a spider clamp. Uh, if we do a Google image search for this, it'll, it might give you a little bit more context. Uh, It's something along these lines. So it's, it's this little clamp thing that clamps four panes of glass together. Um, and there's a variety of styles to how they come together and what the little uh, the rods look like, et cetera. But this is essentially the basics of what we're modeling. You know, something like this is far more uh, intricate than, than what we're modeling. We're simplifying it, but I want to have you guys have a general idea of what these are and how they work together. So the idea is that you have this little clamp you have a rod that comes out and then you have a tension line that's, that's holding the glass together. So you're using tension to keep the, the structural forces at bay as you do this. So we're building this little tiny component, the cable lines, 
and then also a pane of glass that will eventually assemble together into a big uh, wall of this stuff. So sometimes it helps just to see visually what it is that we're doing. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start. I'm going to work in the perspective view uh, to start. I did choose large object inches as my template. Uh, I, I noticed a couple of you last class um, got through the exercise and then realized you were working in millimeters and we had to do some scaling and whatever. So I'm just reminding everybody, um, double check at the bottom here, right down here that it says inches. You want that inches to be, uh, to be active. Interesting. Well, it's a good thing we're not using V-Ray today. <laughs> uh, by the way, there, the computers have been acting up all day. So if your computer acts up, I apologize, but that's just, that's the way it's been. So yeah, I am in inches, so we can go ahead and start working. And what I'm going to start with is drawing the shape that you see in part one, uh, step one right here, which is essentially a two inch radius curve, a 13 inch straight section, and another two inch radius curve. And so as I start to draw that, uh, I'll go ahead and start with the curve tool. And this is one of those things where we have a lot of flexibility in terms of how we create this. I'm just going to start with the basic arc, center, start, and end. And when I do that, um, the center of the arc, I'm going to go ahead and move it over two inches. So the center in coordinates, if I was starting right here at the origin, would be two comma zero. I didn't put an at sign in it, just two comma zero. That would get me started. And then the, the origin here would be 0, 0. That would be the start of my arc. And the end of my arc, I just need it to be 90 degrees. So I can go ahead and turn on my uh, ortho here. And it's going to be right there. And so that creates that first little bit of the arc. You could create it in a different way. You could create the line first and then work from the line. I mean, there's, there's lots of flexibility here uh, in terms of how you actually create it. Next thing I need is I need a polyline. And I'll start by snapping to this endpoint. Currently, my snaps are not on, so I'll go ahead and turn on my end, mid, and perpendicular snaps. Those are the three that I like to have on as I work. And I'll snap right to that corner, and I'll draw over by 13 inches. So it's just the length here. There's my 13 inches, and I can go ahead and finish by pressing Enter again. Now I need this arc over here. I could do the same thing. I could mirror this arc, but I could also just create the arc again. So there's the start and the center. So in this, I would want to come down two inches to get that center. We'll start right there and we'll end right there. And that gives me that piece of the arc as well. So I have this piece, this piece, and this piece. I'd like all of those to become one continuous curve. And I'll do that by selecting them and then going up to edit and then join. So that makes them one continuous curve. And of course, the middle here disappeared because of that error in V-Ray that I haven't, or in uh, Rhino that I haven't changed yet. So let me go to Tools and then Options. Scroll all the way down to View, expand that, click on OpenGL, and uncheck that GPU tessellation option. And there we go. Now I can see my object. OK, so I have a continuous line that starts with this arc, goes straight, and then comes back here. But I'd like it to be standing up in the third dimension. So it's currently flat on the ground. I drew it flat. You could confirm that by looking at it in the top view. Yep, there it is. So I want it to be three dimensional. I want it to be standing up. So I'll use my rotate 3D command. We've done this before. I'll go up to my transform. I'll choose rotate 3D. Alternatively, I could type rotate 3D into the command line. I'll choose my curve and press enter. And then the start of the rotation axis, that is this axis right here, because I want these two points to be down on, on the ground. So I'll snap to this first point, snap to the second point. That's my rotation axis. My reference is going to be going up the Y axis here. And then I'm just going to fold it up till it's standing at perfect 90 degrees. Remember, if I didn't have ortho turned on, I could hold down shift on the keyboard and get it to uh, line up perfectly vertical like that. So all I've done is I've taken that curve that I, that I drew, and I've now made it so that it's standing up like that. So the next piece of this is to go ahead and draw a circle that is right here where we start. So I'm going to come over to my tools here, and I'm going to choose circle. Now in this option, it's asking for the center of the circle. So I'd pick the center of the circle there. 
The next thing here is that it's asking me for the radius of the circle. Well, the little picture that's hard to read here shows a diameter of 0.5. So a diameter of a half inch, which would mean the radius is 0.25. So I'd type in 0.25 and press enter, and that would give me uh, a circle with a diameter of a half inch or a radius of a quarter inch. Alternatively, when you're creating that circle, you could, there I am, switch to diameter mode and type in 0.5, since you know that it's the diameter of 0.5. So pay attention on this exercise as to whether I'm telling you what the diameter is or what the radius is, so that these little um, pieces aren't too big. Okay, so what I have now is I have something that's a curve, and I have something that defines the cross-section of an ultimate shape. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to use a command called a sweep. And what a sweep does is it takes a curve, so in this case, this curve here, and it calls that a rail. And it's kind of like, you could think of it like a railroad track. You have a train running on a railroad track, and there's a rail on one side. That train's going to stay on the track, and it's just going to keep following it. So what we're doing here is we're saying, I want this curve to follow this rail and give me a surface as it follows along. So it's kind of like the follow me tool in SketchUp, if you've worked with that before, though it works a whole lot better. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to my um, surface, and I'm going to choose to sweep one rail. Alternatively, I could type in sweep one. And I'll go ahead, and the first thing it asks me is to select the rail. So the rail in this case is this curve right here. I'll go ahead and press, oh, I don't have to press enter because I'm only selecting one curve. Then it asks me to select the cross-section curve. So the cross-section curve would be this curve right here, that little circle. When I'm done now, I'll go ahead and press enter. It asks me, do I want to drag the seam to adjust? This is just where the seam of the surface would be. The default is almost always just fine. So we're going to leave it right where it is. That's fine. And we'll go ahead and press enter. This then brings up the Sweep One Rail Options dialog box. So by default, the frame style is called Freeform. And I'll explain the difference of these a little bit better uh, when I do some other examples here. But essentially, that means as this curve happens, follow along with the curve, with that cross section, and make it look kind of like a pipe. So we'll stick with that. I'll explain road like in a little bit. And we'll go ahead and come down here. The rest of the options are just fine. And we'll go ahead and say OK. And what I end up with, if I switch to shaded mode, is essentially a tube that follows along that cross section or that, um, that rail that defines what this little tube should look like. So that was a very um, controlled example. You know, alternate, alternate to that, right, I could take, oops, sorry about that, wrong view. Turn back into perspective here. I could make any curve that I wanted, like this. And I could start with a cross-sectional curve, like that. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so it's easier to see. Let's say it's something like that. Now, in this, in this context here, oops, the cross-sectional curve is flat compared to this curve, so I need to rotate that up. So let me take the cross-sectional curve here. It's either the cross-sectional curve or it's this curve. One of them has to rotate up. Um, so I'll just take the cross-sectional curve. We'll rotate that 3D. So I'll go to Transform, Rotate 3D. All right, so now that's standing up. And if I go back to the Sweep 1, I can go in here to my Surface Sweep 1 Rail. I can choose my Rail, then my cross-sectional curve, and press Enter. There's the seam and then it will build that in whatever shape it is that I want. So that's flat still. If I take this curve and I change it and I manipulate some of these control points, let me go ahead and move them vertically. We'll pull those up and maybe we'll pull these two up a little bit too. Okay, so now that same curve is now going up and down in space. I can do the same sweep. So I can go into Surface, I could go to Sweep One Rail, Rail, Cross-Sectional Curve, Enter, 
enter, and now it's created you know, a three-dimensional little pipe there. Does that make sense so far? Okay, so what's, what about if my cross-sectional curve isn't a pipe anymore? So let's say instead of a pipe, I say I want something that's a rectangle. So let me do a rectangle. And again, I'm exaggerating some of this so you guys can see it here a little bit. Let me delete that. I need to do some rotations on this one to get it to, to fall right. Let me rotate 3D. And in this context, I'm going to fold it down so it's below where we're starting here. And I'm also going to rotate this a little bit with a regular rotation. So let me go to transform and then regular rotate. And I'm just going to pull that over. So it's a little more perpendicular to where I start. So now I can do the same thing. I can do my sweep one rail. So I'll go up to surface, sweep run one rail. There's my rail. There's my cross-sectional curve. When I press enter, we're going to start to see some differences. So right here, my frame style is set as freeform. And so if you look at this, as it starts to come up, you see how it kind of arcs around the curve. And then it arcs back, and then it ends up right here, such that my ending point is on an angle where this is flat. If I switch to road-like, it's going to keep this like a path, where the top is always going to be flat. So instead of being able to twist and bank, it's going to keep that a stationary surface as it goes up and down, which may or may not be what you want from a modeling standpoint. But the point is that there's a distinct difference each time with how you do it. So we'll say that road like top is okay. I'll go ahead and say okay. And there is my resulting surface, kind of like a, a path or something that's going around a particular object. Okay? So that's when I switch to road like top versus um, freeform. So now the other option. I'm going to duplicate an edge. So I'm going to type dupe edge, and I'm going to duplicate this edge right there. So that, and let me get rid of the original surface. Now I have both edges of that sweep. So there's technically two rails now. But I'm going to modify this one a bit. Or maybe actually I'm going to modify this one because it has fewer control points. It makes life a little bit easier. So let me take this, and I'm going to make this a little bit bigger by moving these two points out like that. And you know what? Maybe I'll move these two points out a little bit too. Or for argument's sake, I'll move them closer. So I've manipulated those rails. They're no longer parallel. We've previously done a sweep one rail, where this rail has defined the sh with this cross section the end result. I can switch from a sweep one to a sweep two by going into surface sweep two rails this time. So the first rail would be this one. The second rail would be that one. So this is a little bit more like a railroad track, where I have a rail on each side. But in this sense, when I go ahead and select the cross-sectional curve right there and press Enter, there's my seam. I'll press Enter. The cross-section is going to get larger as I get to the curves where they're further apart. So you see how that cross section gets larger? It also gets kind of really funky in this section because they're getting closer together and not getting small enough. We have a couple other options here. Um, we, can, we can try to rebuild the cross sections. Uh, that's smoothing them out a little bit. Uh, refitting isn't going to help us too much. Um, but you guys get the idea here. So in this case, I'm not sure this ended up working out to turn out that well. I probably needed to make this bigger rather than smaller. Uh, to get a, a good result out of it. But I like to show you what the sweep one rail does. Oh, excuse me, the sweep two rails does versus the sweep one rail. The one last thing that I'm going to point out, let me go ahead and delete this. I'll delete the inner one. And that is that the cross-sectional curve does not have to be centered on or touching the rail itself. I could take this cross-sectional curve and I can move it so that it's not even close to where that rail would be. So it's floating out here in space. And I could do the same, sweep one. There's my rail. There's my cross-sectional curve. Enter, enter. And it's going to build it, maintaining the distance between this rail and my cross-sectional curve. So it's important to note that the relationship of the two doesn't have to be in the same uh, plane or attached to one another. Some, I think sometimes visually it makes sense to have it like, oh, it's at the center of this object or it's at the side of this object. 
but it doesn't have to be. And that's something that's important to, to keep in mind as we work through our sweeps. So I'm going to go ahead and delete those objects because they have nothing to do with what I was building, but I think it helps illustrate what a sweep is and how we work with a sweep. So there's my original object. I'm going to Z for uh, zoom, followed by S for selected to recenter my view around that particular object. And then I need to keep building. So at this point, I'm going to create a little button that goes on the end. That's kind of the clamp that holds the glass. So if we jump back to my images here, you can see that there's these little discs that kind of hold the glass. We're building those little discs right now. And so I'm going to do instead, I could um, extrude a curve, but I can also go into my standard uh, shapes and choose a cylinder because essentially that's what it is. So I'll pick cylinder. It's going to ask me for the base of the cylinder. I'm going to pick the very center of this object right there. Then it's going to ask me for a radius. So in here, I have the um, diameter set at an inch and a half, so the radius would be three quarters of an inch. Or I can click on diameter and choose 1.5. Next thing I need to do is I need to choose whether it is um, going down or going up. So in this case, it's going down, so I'll do a negative 0.25. So it's negative quarter of an inch going down. And that then creates this little button. I can do the same thing on the other end, or I could just mirror this to the other side. But for the repetition of it, I'll do it again. I'm going to choose to create another cylinder. I'm going to snap to this end point, I hope. In this case, it doesn't like me, so I might have to turn it upside down so I can see it there. There we go. I'm still in diameter mode at an inch and a half. That's great. And I'm going to be going down negative 0.25 to create that part of the clamp as well. So I have this button and I have this button. Now, the way that these clamps work, there's actually a hole in the glass. So the, this, this piece of metal is on one side of the glass. Then there's a hole in the glass and the, the structure goes through. And then there's a clamp on the other side and the two press together to hold the glass. So I need to create another one of these that's down even a little bit further. So I'm going to go ahead and take this one and I'm going to use the copy command. So I'll go to transform and then copy. Point to copy from. And then I also have the ability to copy vertical. So in this case, vertical is a good idea. So I'm going to go ahead and click on vertical. And then point to copy from. It doesn't really matter where we pick. I'll say right there. And then I can specify a distance. Now I need there to be a half of an inch between these two. So a half an inch plus the quarter inch thickness of this would be 3 quarters of an inch. So I can type in 0.75 inches. Now when I do that, it's going to create that lower one. Oh, excuse me. I have to type in negative 0.75. My fault. There we go. Now it creates that. I'll press delete. So I'll do that one again. I'll take the cylinder here. I'm going to go to transform and then copy. Point to copy from. Oh, I need to be vertical. We'll say right there. This needs to go down by 0.75 inches. So I need a negative 0.75 inches. And that then creates the lower part of this. So you can see that I've created this tube, and then I've created these two clamps on either end to hold that panel of glass. Make sense so far? All right. So I have that. The next part of this, now that I've created this, is that I need one going in each direction. So this one here, I'm going to ultimately rotate by 45 degrees. So I can go ahead and use my regular rotate. I'll go up to transform and then rotate. It's not a 3D rotate. It's just regular rotate. I can start right at my, um, my center, so I could snap right to the center there. I could also type in 0, 0. And this time, I'm going to start there, and I'm going to go up to 45 degrees. So this is a good opportunity to actually type in 45. So I'm going to rotate by exactly 45 degrees. And now that one is rotated like that. I need a second copy of this so that I can have one going the opposite direction, going this way. So when I create that one, I have two different ways of doing it. I'm going to show you both methods here. The first way would be to select my object. I'll go ahead and copy it. So I'll go to Transform and Copy. 
and I'll pull it over here and I'll make a second copy. So there it is. Then I'll take this copy and I will rotate it. So I'll go to transform and then rotate. And I'll rotate it right around the middle. And so in this case, we're going this direction. I need to rotate it by uh, 180. Or no, by 90, sorry. So I could just type in 90. And that would give me that shape. And then I can move it again from the center or the midpoint so that it matches up with the midpoint over here. Now I'm having trouble snapping to this midpoint because I don't see the curve in here. So this is one where switching your view can be helpful. So we've been working primarily in shaded mode so far. But if instead of working in shaded mode, we work in a mode called ghosted, it's almost shaded mode, but we can see the curve through our objects a little bit. So our, our objects have a little bit of ghosting to them. That will allow us to pretty easily move from this middle and snap to that middle. And if I did this correctly, if I look at it from the top view, I should see a perfect little X there on a one foot square, which is exactly what I wanted to have happen. So the, I told you there were two different ways of doing this. So I'm going to go ahead and delete that piece, and I'm going to show you the other way. And this has to do with how efficient you can become as you start to work in Rhino. And it doesn't mean that you have to do it this way. There's nothing wrong with making a copy, rotating, and then moving back. But what I would do if I were modeling is I would take this shape. I would go up to Copy. So I'd go to Transform and then Copy. And as soon as I'm in the Copy command, I can type I or select this In Place option. That means I don't need a base point, just make a copy right on top of itself. So I'll go ahead and click on that. It makes a copy right on top of itself. Notice that the object maintains its selection, so I still have it selected. I can then immediately go into Rotate. So I can go to Transform and then Rotate. I can snap to my midpoint, and I can say 90 and do my rotation. So I've saved the step of copy over here, rotate, and move back. I've made a copy in place and just rotated the copy. So it's a more efficient way of, of working. It doesn't mean that it's the way you have to do it right now. I just like to introduce that as a concept for your modeling speed and technique. So at this point, I've made this uh, little X that's going to hold our glass. I need to make the uh, extension rod that comes up off the top of this. Uh, and that extension rod, if we flip the page over, is from the base, it's two feet to the center of the little uh, cable. Alternatively, from, our, um, from the top of our little spider clamp thing here, it's one foot nine and a quarter. So I'm going to go ahead and make it from the, the base, and then we'll trim it off afterward. And I'll do that by using the same commands that I've been doing. So the first one I'll choose is the polyline, and I'm just going to make it f uh, flat on the ground here. I'll turn on ortho so that I'm straight, and I'll do this at two feet. There we go. And there's my polyon. Next thing I'll do is I'll create my uh, cross-sectional curve. And in this case, it is also a uh, half-inch diameter steel rod. So my diameter listed up there would be 0.5. There it is. I need to rotate that shape three-dimensionally so that it, it stands up. So I'd go to Rotate 3D. Alternatively, I could rotate this line. Ultimately, the line's going to have to be rotated, so it might be more efficient to do it that way. I'll go to Rotate 3D and stand this line up. So there's my axis of rotation. And we can stand that up so it's standing vertically. I could then do my sweep. So I'll go to Surface, Sweep 1 Rail, Rail, Cross-Sectional Curve, Enter, Enter, and it creates oh, one more enter, and it creates that shape. Now, the astute observer here would say, well, wait a minute. Couldn't I also just go and create a cylinder right here with a diameter of 0.5 and a height of 2 feet? Absolutely. So this cylinder is exactly the same as this piece. The only difference is that this cylinder has a top and a bottom on it. We're going to get rid of the top and the bottom anyway, so it doesn't really matter. So that's the thing about Rhino. There's always multiple ways of creating a particular object. I like to show you this, and of course today I'm emphasizing the sweeps, so I'm going to keep doing it via sweeps. 
but I want you to be aware that, that is, uh, there are other options for how you would create this. So I now have this um, little riser here. And then I need a little donut on the end that's going to accept the cable into it. So I'm going to do that, and you can see it that the outside diameter of that little, um, the little donut is an inch and three quarters. So this would be an opportunity to use my curve. Once again, so I'm, I'm creating a circle. I'll snap right here to the center. And I would set my diameter at 1.75 inches. Now, in this view, I would have to, to then rotate 3D. So I go to Transform, Rotate 3D, and we'd stand this up. So it was standing up like that. But if I initiated the circle command in this perspective view and then switched my view into, say, the front view, I wouldn't have to do that rotation. See how that changes? So I've changed the working view from perspective where I started down into this front view where I can just type in 1.75 inches. And I now have, without having to do the 3D rotate, the shape in the correct direction. Does that kind of make sense? So I'm using the viewports to help myself out. So that's the outer diameter. The, the steel tension cable is only 3 eighths of an inch. That would be the inside diameter. So I could do the same thing. Let me snap to this point, and I'll move into the front view here. And in the front view, my diameter needs to be 3 eighths of an inch. So I could type 3 over 8, or I could type in uh, 0.375 to get 3 eighths of an inch. Press Enter, and there's that center cable right there. So if we look at it in perspective, we're seeing the center. We're seeing the outside diameter. Now we need one more circle that represents the cross section of this little donut that we're creating. So if I come back to the circle tool, we've been using the center, the circle center and the radius. But notice hidden underneath, I have some other options, one of which is a circle with the diameter. If I pick that tool, I can actually snap from this edge over to that edge and create a, uh, a circle that's perpendicular to those two curves. If you're having trouble snapping, you can also turn on the quadrant snap, which will snap to the um, north, south, east, and west points on a circle. So I could go from there. Oh, sorry, wrong, uh, wrong tool. Let me click on this diameter circle and go from quadrant to quadrant like that. So this is set up for a sweep. I can sweep using the outer rail or I can sweep using the inner rail, neither of which, uh, either of which is perfectly fine. So I'm going to go ahead and go up to my sweep one rail. So I'll go to surface and then sweep one. There's my rail. There's my cross-sectional curve. I'll press Enter and one more Enter, and that gives me this little donut on the end. You do have in your shapes here, you have a uh, torus, which is essentially a donut. And so we could do the same thing using the torus tool if we wanted to. Interestingly enough, the sweep makes more intuitive sense to me. Like that's how I would build it. But that's again, just a preference. OK, so if I start to look at this, though, my steel rod that's coming up here intersects this torus or this donut at kind of a funky place. And we can see artifacts kind of poking through on the sides. So we need to do some trimming to clean it up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to Edit and then Trim. My cutting object is going to be the donut or the torus. I'll press Enter. And then I can get rid of wherever this rod kind of pokes out. So it pokes out there. That would be clean and through. But I could also take it a step further and get rid of that piece so that I end up with just where the two intersect down here at the bottom. That's a nice, clean way of doing it. Go ahead and press Enter to finish. And there it is. I could also use this object as a trim and get rid of the tiny little bit there such that those made a perfect seam. That's really unnecessary because you you're not going to worry about it from a rendering standpoint, but I'm pointing it out anyway. 
So the next part of this is that this object, this one that I just created, needs to line up with this object right here. So if I were to take this object and I were to move it, let me go to transform and then move, I could snap from this right to the center of that. Now this is too tall because the, the, it's two feet from the, from the bottom up to the top uh, or from where the glass would be. So I actually need to move this down. And I happen to know how far down it is because I drew these curves to begin with. It's two inches. The alternative would be that you could move it and then use your side view as a reference point to get it to come down to where it would match those. So in that context, I would go ahead and start the move vertical. And we could say, I want to move from that point right there. But then I could come in here and reference. See how I can reference one of these points? So I could reference right there on the spider or right there on the spider and actually have that snap as it's coming down. So I'm using this view to help guide my placement. So there it is, placed. But again, I have this object fully intersecting with these two objects. So I need to do some cleanup. Let me go ahead and go to trim. I'm going to select uh, this curve and or this curve. I actually think it's easier to do it one at a time, so I'm going to do just this curve. I'll press Enter, and then I can trim off that lower part right there. And when I do that, it trims all the way up. You can kind of see where it intersects there, like that. I could reach in here a little bit more, and I could try to get rid of more of that. Let's see where the holdover part is. There's a little bit there, that's a little bit there. Whoops, too far, undo. Right, so in that context, I need to trim it a little bit more. You could see, let me, let me illustrate this for just a second. If I hide this, you can see where the intersection has happened with just those two objects. And actually, there's a little bit on this back side that I should get rid of, so let me type trim and I could get rid of that part of the object there. So you can see how those two are intersecting right now. If I type show, I get the object back, and I could then fix it for this object. So let me hide. Now you can see it against this. I would need to do a little bit more trimming here. So I can say that's my cutting object, trim, and we could get rid of that piece and that piece. It doesn't really matter to trim it all the way as long as you've trimmed it off the bottom and you're not seeing it from the bottom. Let me go back to show. And now I have those two pieces there all trimmed out and nice and neat. I could take it a step further and I could trim out these pieces as well where those two intersect. That would be reasonable. Um, so I could go into a trim and I could say, okay, I want to get rid of that piece there and I want to get rid of that piece there. And then I could use this and this as a trim for that piece and that piece. Essentially, you get how I'm working through this. Again, those are all unnecessary, but it's not bad practice to learn how this trim process works. And essentially, what we've ended up doing is we've made it so that there's nothing inside this. It's all hollow um, as they come together. OK, so I've gone through and I've done that part of it. I don't need this curve anymore. That's pretty good. All right, I'd like for the center of this to fall right at zero, zero, or the center of my glass to fall at the bottom of this point, one or the other. So let's go ahead and create the piece of glass. I'm going to just use a box corner to corner. And for, for the ease of snapping, I'll go ahead and snap right to the midpoint there. And so this piece of glass is going to be four feet by six feet. So I can go ahead and type in at relative coordinate here, four feet in the x comma six feet in the y and my thickness is going to be a half inch, so 0.5. And I'll go ahead and press Enter, and that gives me that pane of glass right there. This needs to be moved down so that it falls in the center of those little buttons. So I'm going to go ahead and type Move, or go to Transform and then Move, and I will specify that this is a vertical move, which it is. And I want it to move down so that it references, and you can see me doing this here, so that it references right there which means that the, the spider is going to fall exactly 
on either side of that glass. Okay, so that falls there, that's nice. You can kind of see how this is going to work because if I were to take this object and copy it and put it up here, I'd get another of that object and they would tile together as I make it a much larger wall. That's the idea here. So I'm going to go ahead with this object and I'm going to add a little bit of steel cable going up here. So I'm going to do one more sweep. I'm going to do a line right from the center. There it is. And that's going to be at six feet so that it matches the height of the, whoops, so that it matches the height, oh, come on, of the glass, six feet in that direction, press enter. I already have the little circle from when I created the donut or the torus, and I can do that using a sweep, so I'll do a sweep one, my rail, followed by my cross-sectional curve right there, I'll press enter, and then one more enter, and okay, and I end up with that steel cable going up on the side here. So I've now made all the geometry that I need to make. The last thing I need to do is just kind of put it into uh, view so that I can kind of see what it would look like, uh, do a little rendering of it, etc. So the rendering is going to be a little tricky because we're, we don't have any context. Glass is always hard when there's no context around it. So we're going to give it a few shots and see if we can't make it look okay. I'm going to go ahead and rotate it up first. So I'm going to go into my uh, transform, I'm going to go to rotate 3D, and I'm going to stand this little piece up so that it's standing up vertically. I'm going to go ahead and move it vertical so that it's above the ground plane, since it's hanging down there a little bit. And then I'll add, just like we have done in the past, I'm going to add a V-Ray infinite plane underneath for my rendering. I'm going to add a basic directional light, but I'll use my little box to set that up for myself. So there's my box. I'll click on the directional light tool, low corner to high corner. Now my directional light is, is falling down on my object. That's good. 